Hey everyone, my it's Neil Brennan. This is the Blocks Podcast. We talk to people about their inner lives. I told my guest today what the premise of the podcast was, and he wrote back two words, Jesus Christ. But he is a guy I've known a long time. The good news about you is you've always looked older than you. Can I get an he, intro, intro, please? I'm going to give you an intro. What, what is going on? You always look 40. Am I? Yes. I look, I look really Now old, it's, though. you look good. You look like a distinguished older gentleman. <laughs> um, he's always looked 40. Then next thing I knew, he was playing, he was in a retirement home show, which I didn't appreciate. All right, everybody just relax. Act like we have Alzheimer's. He's a, I hate all the things they call us now. Legends and I, us, icons. OG. OG, I don't mind so much. The guy was in, in living color. <laughs> Before that, he was in Robert Townsend's shorts on HBO. And before that, he went to Yale Drama School, where he did a play with Christopher Walken. <laughs> and in between scenes, while the play was going on, he looked over and Christopher Walken was reading a porno mag. And the name of the porno mag was Big Black Titties and Asses. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David Allen Greer Wait, is the guest. Let me, can I just put an addendum on the Chris Walken? That made him a hero to me. <laughs> no, I don't think it's, <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't, don't get me no, wrong. I'm not, plus, I was in school, man. I was like, oh, this dude is a god. So we can read porn? <laughs> yeah, literally. Between? He would throw the, the thing down. My lady, I beseech the court. You know, like right in it. And he was great. If a actor can be that good that quickly, do you think it's an abuse of power? <laughs> do, no. do you expect a level of, what's your process with that? Do you expect to be, do you try to focus just out of respect for everyone around? Or is it just like, I don't know, I'll be there? No, professionally. I'll give you an example. I was doing Soldier's Play. Uh-huh. Became Soldier's Story. Were you in the first one? I was in all of them. You were in the first Soldier's Play in the late 80s? Yeah, it was 1984. 1984. Then myself, Denzel, Adolf Caesar. We went on to do the movie. Right. And this is at a time when usually people who did the play, you weren't going to do the movie. Nah. Denzel was get, in the play. Yeah, yeah. You know, say say it's like um, a double amputee, Southeast Asian tiger cage, prison, Cambodian conflict. And uh, someone like Killian Murphy did it on stage. Well, you know that uh, if they did the movie, it would be a Disney kid. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and they'd be and they'd be right. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So, so we the fact that we were cast and Norman Jewison, so we went right in and did the movie, yeah. and that was it. I mean, I thought I was done with it, but. And then it, you did it again. Because Kenny, Kenny Leon called me the director, and you know what? It, 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 I just had to do it. I mean, those are the it best It was two jobs. years ago, three years ago? It was uh, the, the beginning the reboot? of the— reboot? So it wasn't a reboot. No, it was the beginning of the pandemic, because we okay. got all the way through our run. We had three shows left, and they shut Broadway down. Oh, okay, so you did it, and did you get—you've been to Tony nominated? I have. I've, I've received four Tony nominations. I won the Tony for that particular role. And can I just say— I, you know, the evening started with, hey, I'm nominated with my girlfriend. We went to the best restaurant probably in the country. Sbarro. Sbarro on 44th Street. <laughs> no, no. Mama Leone's. And um, <laughs> the, uh, no, it was just a great week, a great night, just the vibes, all the love. And then I won. And, uh, you know, I just want to say we've been lied to because winning is. Didn't solve your problems. It, it did. Oh, it was so even fun. worse. No, it yeah, was no, so I know it's not just fun. an honor to be nominated. No. It's so much better when you win. Oh my God, it it is amazing. So you no, know, don't believe the hype, kids. Get that, win. Get that reward. Is Winners only. Says. Um, is my brother? I say you mean award? No, I mean reward. Okay. Okay. All I don't right. see the difference. But All right. God bless. Mm, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um. I haven't seen you in a while, but you're one of you're a great person to me. You you uh I I've never had a bad time spending time with you. And that may be the highest compliment, by the way. I've never had a bad time hanging out with you? Yeah, because well, like any relationship, you know, really mostly when I was younger, you know, like you had a roommate and like
like uh, when you sour, at least for me, if I sour on you, I just have it's to, over. Yeah, I'm gonna block you. Yep. Just move on. We don't have to talk about it. I don't know, like a lot of men who, you know, uh, we're not gonna be friends anymore, Neil. Can we have lunch? I just want to tie up loose ends <clears throat> and go over some things, some transgression. Yeah. No, guys, just bye. I'll see you later. Especially at this point in my life, I'm just gonna block, delete, move on. Much like winning an award. It's very rewarding. <laughs> it is because mainly the people I've blocked and moved on from is probably a lot of it's political views. Now, I don't know. I, I pretty much can guess your political views, but when it impedes, just based on the clear frame glasses, <laughs> right? when it when it impedes on the friendship. If I'm texting you all day and night, going, man, you got to get on this MAGA train, man. Uh huh. Trump yes. is brilliant. You know, yeah. it's then memes. it's a, then it's an annoyance, man. I don't because I don't want to argue. I don't, we don't have to debate. You know, in my place of work, if I see somebody who's go Trump, I'm gonna be like, that's not my choice. But you go, go, go ahead. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. Okay. I'm going to do what I can do, but I'm not going to argue about that stuff. But you will end, you will end a relationship. You will end a personal friendship. You won't end a I relationship, have. but it will end I a have. personal relationship of like, we're not going to see eye to eye. And well, well, not if I'm, not if I'm bringing it, not if the person is shoehorning it in all yeah. of our conversations yeah. Yeah. in texts and emails and just memes. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. You wearing me down. Yeah. You know, uh, uh-uh. uh, so give him, you throw a baby in there. You wearing me down, baby, <laughs> baby, you wearing me down. <laughs> no, man, you know how it is. It's yeah. just, uh, <laughs> I'm the king of, of ending friendships. We, t- we spoke about it before we on the air. You're I, in my experience, you're a good texter. You're a good tweet. You're all, you're pretty active on the tweets, especially considering your age and that you should know better. Can I, can I brag on myself a little bit? I would bit? love that. Finally. I got into a boomer fight. You know, this is like, Great. okay, boomer. And I how old are you, by the way? 67. Great. And, uh, true or uh, little known fact about David Allen Greer. What could have gone to see Jimi Hendrix live? I could have. And didn't because you couldn't, you had homework or something? Well, I was 13. Right. And, and to be honest with you, I still had the fear of my mom. Like, I could have gone to Cobo Hall. I didn't know that Jimi Hendrix in 1969 would be dead within a year. Number no, one. No, no, no one did. And I was more concerned with if I got in that concert, my mother still was of an age where she would come in there, pull me out. Pull me By out. the ear. There may be curlers involved. Yep. Purse. Uh, just, yeah. I just was not prepared to defy her like that. Sure. Yet. You know, a couple of years, I was just, you know, whatever. Earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't. Okay. So you got no boomer fight. Go on. So, I, you know, I said some lame joke, and these boomer guys started coming after me. And at one point where I was just being pounded, you know, fuck you, you bought your house for a dollar, and I have to pay $5 million, and my dad's old, and guess what? He yeah. shits on himself. Nobody uh-huh. told me that. Uh-huh. When you're 85 and you had several strokes, I was, you know. And uh, at one point, one of the dudes goes, I, you know, I got to give it up to you, man. Your meme skills are next level. And they were talking amongst themselves. They're like, I don't even know where he gets these things. Look, man. I don't know what this, this guy's got <laughs> must have a young team around yeah, him. Yeah, so I was like, even in the midst of all that, I was like, thank you. What did you it say that stupid. got him upset? It was something along the lines of everything's fine. You know, you give your kid a credit card, everything's fine until the bill runs at 2500 right, right, right. stupid. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Some just, rich people uh, shit. It's yeah, not yeah, even yeah, boomers. Dumb, it's, dumb shit. Yeah. And um, but it was piling on to and, and, you, and the thing about the internet or social media, there's no sarcasm and there's no irony. You, you, you can't, because half the shit, you know what I'm uh, we can get into this, but half the shit I say, I'm fucking with people. Yeah. And 90% of people don't know. You know, I got in a huge fight one time, and these dudes are like, man, what the fuck kind of old soft-ass bitch-ass shit? And I was like, okie-dokie. What kind of motherfucker says okie-dokie? Okie-dokie. I kept saying it until finally this, like, teenage Hit him with an okie-dokie art- artichoke? <laughs> Hit him with an artichoke? Yeah, the teenage white girl goes, David Allen Greer is trolling you. Shut the fuck up. White women to the rescue again. <laughs> exactly. He, he, you know, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. Um. All right, so what has been what is it easy to be you 
<laughs> is it? Yeah, now it is. But was it always easy to be? What were what have been the big problems of your life? Well, you know, big problems were first of all, I feel like I've had a blessed life. For From most the outside of, in, I would agree. Yeah, my, my dad was a doctor until he left us when I was 10. So I got half. I got like really cool upper middle class family right. 60s when that meant something. You know, new car every two two years and nice big home. And then when you know when my father and my mother broke up, then my mom was on a teacher's salary. Salary. Got it. As my dad was like, you know, he wrote this hit book. He'd be on the news. Gentlemen, in the foreword to your book, United States Senator Fred Harris said that although slavery has not been practiced in this country for over a hundred years, the mind of the citizen has not been freed. Do you feel that this is the root cause of the Negro problem? We feel it is a very important cause. The uh, attitude of the society generally, of white people, and unfortunately of some black people, is that black people are inferior and should, in fact, occupy an inferior status in this society. And again, you know, in 67 or 8, there's no cable, there's no computers. If your family member were on any program like Live at Five, it's that incredible. was big shit. Yeah. That was it's like having world. a Netflix special. Exactly, Literally. man. Exactly. So so it was- April 9th. <laughs> yeah. Crazy good, it's called, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I just talked to my brother the other night and just reminiscing about our childhood. You know, those are, those are important things. I mean, my career, I have never, this last year is the longest stretch I've had without a job. And that's been because of the strike. Okay. You were you you could sing when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, I do one thing that came out of this conversation, you know, I growing up in Detroit is at a very young age, I was fixated on I'm getting the fuck out of this town and I'm Why? gonna get famous. Because like every kid, it's Detroit. What the f it's yeah, boring. It's a small town, yeah. You know, all my friends were going to law school or be a doctor and dentist. No, I don't want that. I want to be famous and I want to make money. And that was fixated on it. I did not know. From an early age. Because oh, yeah, I, I, I was I, 11 yeah. or 12. Yeah. and But I didn't know how at that point because right. I didn't know I was going to be an actor. Who were famous to you then? Rock stars. You know, rock stars. I remember when we were in Berkeley, I was with my mom. You saw I, Sly Stone? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. I, I saw a lot of people. But so we're standing in front of this boutique and they had these silver platform shoes with rainbows and stars and stuff on them. And this is before the rainbow meant having rain having silver boots in 1968 was like having a million followers on Instagram. Yeah, so I so we we're just standing there. I must have been like 12 and I go, "Mom, I see we don't even I don't I don't know, I want those boots." And my mom looked at me like, "Why would you want those boots?" I'm very concerned. You know, just like you may be insane. I just want not to be boring, not to be in a yeah. fucking little town and get married to my high school sweetheart and just have. I, I never wanted to have. Do, okay, a job, do you job. understand when people think that that's like you have bad values, or are you just like, no, I just want to. No, because I worked very hard. Okay. I just didn't work at med school. Got it. I worked very hard. I mean, I got into fucking. Uh, Yale. I mean, and even at that. Where'd you go undergrad? U uh, U University of, of Michigan. And you wrote a very nice letter for Al Madrigal's daughter. I Producers was told the, the other day, ladies and gentlemen. I did. I did. It was a form letter. But I did put my heart and soul into it. No, very, very nice. Have you letters. donated money? No. Great. You, no one should donate money to their college. I'm on the board. I'm on the board of the drama school. Oh, great. So you worked hard. You went to U of M. Then you, so you were, you had... Good values and a good work ethic about a, what someone would say, a shallow thing. Yeah, but I mean, I wanted to be an actor. Once I, once I settled on that, because that was the first thing I thought, well, I can grow old and be an actor. I can be, that was Prove the first it. thing for me. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. <were. laughs> no, but I mean, for me, because even with music, I was like, yeah, but you got to be young to make it in music. But I yeah. really was into it. So you thought maybe rock star for a second. Yeah, I was a songwriter. I dropped out of school and moved. I was performing. And after about 10 months, it was that thing. A bunch of things happened. I saw and started hanging out with like for real actors. And they were the first people to go, you know what? You should be an actor after watching me, at, you know, at 19. After watching you sing? 
or watching just you after watching me sing, perform, just hanging out. Right. I worked in this podcasting. Ice cream <laughs> right. I worked in this ice cream store, Hagen Das ice cream store, which, which again in 1975, Hagen Das was like, what is the most premier? Brand Salt like and food. straw. Yes, it was. It was. Yeah, no, it was foreign. Hoity toity. Yeah, it was foreign ice cream. By the way, some middle aged white cream. dude made up the name. Hagen Das means oh, that's nothing. Funny. It, you know, but so at any rate, it was there and it was crossed from a disco tech, Barney Googles, which during Do the Hustle, it was yeah. all right there. Um, I remember a guy came in with his girlfriend. They used to come in. And it was late at night, and I did, he asked me for an ice cream cone, and I did some song and dance, just because I was bored and just 19. And the guy stopped and goes, you're an actor. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to come back tomorrow at noon, and I'm going to talk to you, because I want you to know that I'm legit, that I'm not drunk or high. I'm not wow. trying to exploit you in any way, and we're going to talk. And indeed, he did come back. And so that's pushed me. That started it. And what was he? Was he an actor? He was an actor. He Got was it. an actor. With and he was his like, he knew girlfriend. one when he saw one. <laughs> yeah. 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 And he uh, he was living with his girlfriend, so he was definitely an actor. <laughs> yeah. And he had a spider monkey. I remember that. Fantastic. Like back then, I was like, oh, okay. Did you, and you never really like tripped off a race too much. What do you mean? Meaning like it wasn't a big uh like U of M, Yale, what they would call white spaces. Yeah. Well. Well. I, I can get to that, but you know, as a kid, I've thought about this. As a kid, um, when there was not a lot of representation, kids are gonna kid. Meaning, I'm gonna be a munchkin, I'm gonna be Superman. I'm, we just inserted ourselves in any and every possible scenario. Yeah. Um, that's what kids do. I'm not saying it's the way to go, I'm not saying it was helpful, I'm just saying in a pinch, yeah, kids are gonna kid. use your imagination. Yeah, kids are gonna kid. Yep. I'll be Elon Musk. I'll be sure. this part, that part. You know. So that's what we did. I was aware of it, but my energy was like, I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want, and I'm not. I don't care. I'm gonna go for it, and that's what I've always thought. You know, unless I don't make it, then I can fall back on race and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Very smart. Um, really, no really dummy. smart. And I don't think anyone's ever thought that before. Uh, okay, and then, and then, so you, you, and you could do it. I discovered, you know, Neil, you have this belief. Right. You had a suspicion about yourself. Like, I should be on TV. I feel like I should be oh, getting no, no, more no, no, attention no. than I am. I just said I should be famous. I didn't you really didn't know process how is this going to happen. Because okay. I, I, I hadn't yet. So what happened was a girl who lived across the street from me, she was dating this guy. And when we all went to Michigan, he brought me into acting and he jumped me in like a gang. His name is Ron O.J. Parsons. He is from Buffalo, New York. And he was like, basically, yeah, so my girl told me that you're funny and uh, I got some stuff for you. So I'm going to need you to come to the theater and we can do some things. It was like being jumped into a gang or the mafia. And I'm yeah. like, oh, oh, okay. I didn't really know I could act. I knew I wanted to try it. And then I did. For the attention or for the trans, what it does to you to do it? Well, I was still trying to find my place. You know, but back then, again, all of my friends were all going to, you know, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. I knew that didn't turn me on, but I didn't know. We'll believe it. <laughs> right, an right, it was an old right. thing that they used to say. They'd say, Dr. Lawyer and Chief, it was a different time. Native American <laughs> elder. Yeah, We're yes. Dr. Lawyer, they, Native American whatever. elder. Yeah, Go yeah, ahead. Right. But I mean, you know, we fantasize and then you got to do it. I started acting and I realized I have some talent here. I mean, one of the great things about when you're young is when you, we're knowing, we're booting up, we're getting to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we have desires and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, maybe I can pull this off. Um, that's what it was. It was like, oh, You okay. have a lot of tools, though. Yes, I, but like, I discovered them. That. I remembered when I talked to my mom, I go, nobody in our family ever acted? She goes, no. We have one crazy Alice. That was my fifth cousin. And she, she spent a long time in the asylum. That's what right. I was told. So no sense of humor. Like, if you would have come to my house, um, it just would not be... It would be like well, it is a weird time. thing where you've always looked like yourself 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I remember, yeah. like, Bold and the Beautiful, or Black and the Beautiful. Alderman Dexter Mitchell is David Allen Greer. Daddy's been a naughty boy. Like, oh, I, that, that's who he is. <laughs> this but is even, 1985. I'm in, yeah. I'm 12 or something, and I see him. Like, yeah, that guy looks like, you knew the joke, you knew how to do it, you knew... But you know, I, then yeah. I went to drama school, and all my friends were like, "Oh, I'm cast as a as a nursemaid in the Guthrie. Great, Catherine, you'll be great." I mean, I wanted that part, but also, you know, someone brought me the first playbill when I did my first professional job on Broadway, called first by about Jackie Robinson, first black ball player. I digress. Who? <laughs> but, but you had to write your bio. I had no credits because it was my first professional job. And I do not remember writing this, but it, at one point he says, you know, David has, you know, he has an MFA from Yale. He's done uh, Wine in the Wilderness at the Lab Theater in Ann Arbor. And he has performed in comedy clubs all over this country, which was absolute bullshit. <laughs> I never, there, never are, are, there barely were comedy clubs at that point. But, they, but you know, 81, 80. Yeah, but the comedy boom had started. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got and it. that was where the sexy shit was. And and so then that became something. I, I think I want to try this. And so I just put it on my I put it on my bio. Damn it, that's so <laughs> funny. Yeah, I had no. I and had, you still didn't do stand-up for a long time, right? No, because I was acting. And um, what happened was I met Robert Townsend. We did Soldier's Story together. Oh, he was in the movie, right? He shared a honey wagon. Now, you're a comic, so you you appreciate this. Robert and Denzel were really good friends, but I thought Robert Townsend was the funniest, most brilliant person I'd ever seen. He came in, and we shared a honey wagon, which is like a half of a trailer. It's not even the size of this space right so we were there together and um he was doing this material he was doing mo money he was doing all of, and then at one point i was like going oh my god he has like 17 routine i was just rolling and he goes oh yeah that's my friend damon that's his that's his routine oh he was doing other people yeah stuff. yeah yeah but he yeah. Would, you know he would claim it he wasn't like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote that yeah but still and and i was not of the comedy world i was just amazed I remember we, we we drove on a day off uh, from Soldier Story. Robert and I, we drove, we were in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and 1983. So they changed the movies. There's one movie, uh, uh, movie theater. They changed the movie once a month. We were there for three and a half months. We drove to Tulsa, I think, as a road trip just to see movies. You were shooting like on a barracks somewhere? Yes. Fort Smith, Fort, what, what, yeah, Fort Smith, Ar okay. Arkansas. Fort Chaffee, that, that's, that's the name of the base that we were on. While we were there, Robert says, okay, we're going to go to this comedy club and see my friend Larry Miller. And, you know, I'd seen Bill Cosby when I was 12. But to sit in that club, half-filled club, and Larry, my experience then was like, how is he talking for an hour? Yeah. Like, this shit is just falling out of his ass. There's no character. He's thinking it up on the spot. Like, I didn't know the process. I just was amazed like how yeah. can you do this and it's funny and you're holding my attention and then i and then you know robert was like no nah, that's his act you know he's like what the, what is your what do you respect more at this point stand up or acting it's not respect it's how i define myself well uh, okay at the end of the day i always defined myself as an actor personally right i did stand up for a long time I, quite as it's kept i've quit stand up but i, I kind of knew make, that yeah i didn't make an announcement right um i just because i felt i was done. david we're all feeling it <laughs> I, know, I know i mean when you're in a club and you're like uh my sciatica is crazy yeah. guys give it up for sciatica. oh no yeah. i just felt like i didn't really have anything to say yeah and you know, I just wanted to do something else. But um, in that moment, though, back to the Larry Miller thing, this was a whole new terrain. I'd seen Richard Pryor, and Richard Pryor was like one of my major idols. Sure. But I never looked into the mechanics yeah. of stand-up until I started doing it. And when I started doing it is because I would hang out with Keenan, Robert, and those guys. Uh, I was out here doing my first TV show like in 1985, 86, called All is Forgiven. And that was created uh, by the Charles Brothers, who just had done Cheers. Oh, wow. So I was at the Porsche dealership. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be back in 10 days, man, because 
You know. Remember this face, baby. Exactly. <laughs> I remember our premiere. I think it was behind Cheers. We pulled a twenty million do- twenty million viewership, uh-huh. and the network was like, "Well." Mm. Mm. I showed one of the I showed one of the producers on the Carmichael's the number, and he almost fainted. And still, they were like, "We just saw you do a little bump." You didn't really go yep. up, you know. So you just felt like you had talent and or, and, or you wanted to be famous and then it, it ended up being that you could, yes, you could I do it. Yes, I discovered these things because uh, back to there, I'm jumping around because, you know, that's what I do. I remember asking my mom because that's an awesome thing as a young person. Like, I have this talent and I wanted to know where did it come from? It's not like you guys are busting out the dick jokes. No. Yeah. You know, and I was just amazed that I had this gift, which that's what it felt like. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it was there. And, you know. Well, was, let me let me jump off that onto this. Does it make you, what do you, do you believe in a God? Some days. Usually when there's a semi heading for me. I, but to be but serious. When, but with that in mind, with like, I came out pretty formed to have a, very successful professional life was a big part of life. And for those people who don't haven't seen your show, that takes that took a lot. I mean, for you to get to this. <laughs> yeah, well, that's ayahuasca and DMT. Right. It wasn't um, like you were being encouraged. No. So what to I'm saying, clown. <laughs> yes, correct. Uh, but so what I'm saying is, do you ever do you feel like I don't know? This is something I'm yeah. I'm touched in some way. Yeah, but, you know, that varies. I remember when I came out to L.A. and it was pilot season. I'd been acting and pretty successful, making money, taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't done The Living Color yet. And I really got to the point where I really did not know if that was my ceiling. You know, a few guest spots. Right, 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 right. High school friends. Hey, man, I know that dude. Yeah. I even thought about law school. And I, you know. Did some research, and I realized early on, you're not going to law school, dude. Just shut the fuck up. You are not. Put it down and go put on the clown nose. And shortly thereafter, Living Color came, and all that shit blew open, man. All of it. And was it ever enough? Because you strike me as somebody that could be like a a comparer. It was always wanting more. Um, But... That was a a certain period. I will tell you, I think I was driving somewhere and I read in the trades when that's when we used to buy like the Hollywood Reporter or Variety. Martin Lawrence was getting 20 million on his next film. And I was like, I need to pull over. I need to pull over. Because I had just gotten off the phone with my agent. He was like, they're offering scale plus 10. But I think we can bump them up. about (laughs) $25,000. Yeah, I think we can bump them up, you know, get five, 10 more. No, I was like, but to know, you know, Martin and I started together. We were good friends. Those were certain times where I just went, oh, God, I I really have to recalibrate. I mean, you know. And also when you're on, you're on A Living Color with Jim Carrey, Damon Wayans, Keenan Wayans, Jamie Foxx, whom I'm sure, Tommy Davidson. You guys are, it's like seven hungry dogs. Which is one of the reasons why I didn't want to do it. Because again, I didn't come from a stand-up background. I didn't have uh, Scratchy the pimple guy, you know, uh-huh. my go-to character, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, I didn't want to, that feeling of crabs in a barrel. Uh, everybody's trying to stab everybody else in the back. I just wanted a good part. But right. I was talked into doing it because it was after a season of, I must have auditioned for over 30 pilots. That was when you could do that. And it was because the casting directors kind of knew me. They were, okay, well, David, this this is an albino little person, but I don't know, just read. Uh, yeah. You know those kind of auditions? Yeah. Well, show us what you have, Neil. Uh-huh. You know, this 12-year-old girl, she really hates her dad. Go. You know, <laughs> you're like, uh. So nothing panned out. And at the end of pilot season, I moved back to New York, and Kim Wayans, like uh, just an evil cult leader kept calling going you're making a mistake you have got to come back you've got to come back you got to do this show this is going to be great the so they offered it to you or like oh yeah they offered it. me a couple times yeah because initially it was you like, were like and you had done it with them in in yeah. robert's movies and yeah and yeah. were you and i'm gonna get you sucker yes i was in that okay. so they knew me yeah. you know in keenan and and uh so 
you know, then you're going to be in the cast. We have to go through this network thing because we I, I went to New York and we had to like improv for the uh, network, the studio. Yep. I uh, auditioned with Susie Essman, M Martin, and uh, who else? I think those are the two. Those are my friends. I didn't know Susie 88? that well. Yeah, it was something like that. And um, that's kind of where I first felt oh, I can do this. It's going to be fun, man. Because, you know, Keenan would just call out sketches and ideas, and I really got in a groove, and I felt really great, and I was, I'm going to try this. But in doing that, after coming out of Yale, that was going against the grain there because they were doing, like, Shakespeare in the yeah. Park, and I was like, eh, eh, now I'm going to do this show because I knew it was going to be fun. I knew all my friends were going to be there, and I fucking just went for it. Did And did you ever get in your head about it or was it you were very different than all of them so that was the the good news and why they needed you is because like you were you you did have a different tone i realize that now but again when you're yeah young, well that, okay so you're comparing yourself to who were movie stars and who became movie stars how'd that sound well once we got on the show it was just we're do, we're working. Yeah, but I'm you're holding all, my own with you. Of course, I'm but my then own he own. gets Ace Ventura. I know, but that happened a while ago. Now they offered me, uh, no, they offered me Ace Ventura, one of those, because it was a script that was yeah. just floating around. Around these producer came to me and said, "Well, maybe you and Rob, who's that dude from SNL, who's really Schneider? conservative? Yeah, Rob Schneider." Yeah. I was like, "No, I passed on it." Jim took it. And said, I'm going to do what I'm going to, you know, I'm going to this out. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Yes. He really was like a cancer patient. And he said, sir, you're dying in six months. This Great. Your only shot. Role and action. <laughs> I sat next to him at the premiere and I felt so bad for Jim because, you know, nobody's going to see this crazy movie. Mm -hmm. We used to kid each other. And I said, Jim, if I ever win the lo uh, 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 lottery, I'm going to give you $5 million. And we would play around so you can make your movie. Jim Carrey would do this character called Colon Man, where he <laughs> could pull his colon out of his ass, small intestines, and lasso criminals and suck you right back <laughs> into his ass and hold you for the police. Uh -huh. You know, shit like, yeah. just to add each other crying. Uh -huh. So I said, I want you to do that, okay? Do that. If I ever win the lottery, this is going on. That's what he did, basically. He, he made that, Colon Man. I, yes. No, he he yeah, yeah. Ace Ventura? Yeah. There was a point where I think he what was the love interest? What's her name from Friends? Corny Cox. Yeah, they were there. And it was like, Jim had been so crazy. And I said, you know, literally she's like something like, Hello, Ace. And I said, Okay, this is Jim's gonna be normal now. <laughs> <laughs> he went. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So I came out. I saw Chris Rock in the lobby. This was at the same screening at Westwood. And I said, man, Chris, I don't know what I'm going to do, man. I feel bad for Jim. but I'm going to support him because I was laughing. He was so nervous. He was crawling out of his seat. But nobody's going to see this movie. It's too crazy. I just thought, this is too crazy for yeah. America. Chris put his hand on my shoulder like an older brother. He said, no one, David, is going to see this movie. <laughs> so, you listen to me. Exactly. I said, okay, yeah. I'm not crazy. And you know what yes. happened next? Yes. It blew Over up. Over $27 million. It blew, it blew yeah. up. And I forgot, Jim was on Howard Stern, and he was saying, like, the next day, you know, that next week, we were back doing In Living uh -huh. Color. And we would come out and play with the audience and stuff. And uh, he described how I came out there. And I was like, you know, during the whole bit, like, uh, Jim's movie opened last week. And um, I just want to say good luck, you know. I'm not <laughs> jealous or any fucking thing, you know, so no anger here. Because <laughs> that's what we did. We made a comedy yeah. bit out of everything. So, But uh, but were you actually, uh, did you feel less than with at any point in that? Um, in that it's hard, it must have been hard on your spirit a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because I was married by that time. Uh -huh. I didn't have kids. Um, yeah, man, you want to be with your supposed peers. I didn't want want to be doing guest spots on ALF, and which I did. And no, I wanted all of that. I wanted all of it. And that is when I thought, 
maybe I've miscalculated. Maybe this is as far as I can go. But, yeah. Did you ever? But I, so then you get a lemon color, mm -hmm. and then your go, it's going great. It's no, there's always something else. Everybody was doing press, and at that time, who was the old guy who used to clear talent on the Tonight Show? Jim, uh, Freddie de Cordova, or no, no Jim McCauley. Jim McCauley was still there. Yes. They brought me in. You know, I met with them. Freddie de Cord Cordova was there. And I'm like, I really want to go on one of these late night talk shows. I mean, I'm, when's it going to happen? What do I have to do? And they're like, well, you know, in the show, they're going to go with the main guys, you know, Keenan, Damon, because Damon blew up. Yep. He was the first one. I remember when Homie the Clown was like, right. have a seat. Let me tell you about Whitey. <laughs> Entertainment Weekly yes. magazine. I think it was the number one comedy character. I mean, people love it. Yes. It's great. And once they cycle through them, David, they're going to filter down to your level, which is um, probably second tier, third tier. Then they'll bring you on. And they kept making that mouth noise? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, I was like, I'm on a tour tier? Okay, cool. Let's do it. Um, yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. Always more. Always more. Um, how do you... Uh, d don't how, you? I mean, everyone, Of course. But what I'm saying is how do you deal with that part of yourself? Do you try to go like, f go like yo, you got to chill because this is very good? Or no, do man. you, Or do you Just, think that that's helpful? No, I started doing stand-up. You know, I'd never really done stand-up. I, I would do stand-up to hang out with Robert and Keenan and those guys. Right. So I started doing spots. Okay. Um, but just for fun, I'd really, yeah. there's no log longitudinal thinking that I'm going to get on this TV show. It's going to feed my road work and I'm going to do a special. No, right. I just thought it's fun because after a certain point, Robert and those guys said, you can't just hang out with us in comedy clubs and observe. You have to do comedy. They actually said like, Hey, they kind of intervened. Like, yes. this is enough. Yeah, you you're can't funny just, enough to do this. So either do it or even, leave. It wasn't even you're funny enough. Because it, it wasn't, wasn't just you. The, it was also Eddie Murphy and Rock were yes, around too, right? Yes, so it was yeah. like. Well, Chris I'd met when I was in New York. Chris, I, I met him. What is the special Eddie did? And which, Uptown Comedy Express. Boom. I, 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 yes. I met him right around there. Yes. And I lived right around the corner from Catch a Rising Star. Okay. That was my yes. last shitty fucking horrible apartment I had in New York. So I knew Chris a long time. Um, Damon, anyway, Damon would go and do stand-up comedy. And I always looked down on it. You're in the saloon telling dick jokes. That's so sad. And he told me how much he made, which I think at the time was like. Tell uh, me more about the saloon. <laughs> yeah, he was making like 18000 25, yeah. something like that for yeah, two or for three days. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Literally within 30 days. Hello, D.C.? <laughs> you know? So I wrote my jokes up. I did my spots, and I got, I got an agent, and I started going out, and that changed my career for years because that allowed me a cushion to say no. Like uh, I didn't have to play. Uh, what was this dude in this James Spader movie? It was Radio. Like, <laughs> it was worse. <laughs> the gay window dresser in Meshach mannequin. Meshach Taylor in mannequin. Type? Yeah, in yeah, mannequin. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember they called for that, and I, I didn't have to because right. I started doing comedy, and that allowed me to go make yeah. this other money. Um, but I got burned out, man. I got burned out. during In Living Color, I would take two weeks off. Then I would tour all summer until – and th you're talking about like from probably May to August – clubs some theaters mixed in grinding uh -huh. and i would take two weeks off at the end of summer and then i was back on the show so i did that for like three or four years and i just started getting burned out like i wasn't my income jumped but my happiness didn't yeah. jump it was just a grind man and what was what's your inner what is your inner life like what do people what are your loved ones what negative things do your loved ones say about you um, it was more or me. relationships. It was more me be because honest. it took a while for me to voice it because I was on a hit show. I was playing sold out clubs and stuff. Yep. I'd done Boomerang in 93. And I remember when I was heading to someplace like uh, Houston or something and my ticket sales just 
skyrocketed, you know, because Boomerang was a really big movie. A huge movie. And all of that. But inside, I just was tired, you know? Yeah. You get on this plane, you get on this other plane, go to my Milwaukee, go to the press, you know, or morning press. Yep. It was fucking... Yeah. Yeah, man. So I was getting burned out. And um, like everybody, I wanted to do a huge fucking Born on the Fourth of July, uh, one-armed prison escapee crying, I'm my kid, I'm my kid, Johnny, you know, all that yeah. stuff. And that was that's not what I was getting yet. So there was always more and and always questioning. I don't did not know in that moment if I was really going to get to the level that would shut me up, I don't think there is a level. Because well, yeah, that's what I wonder. I'm like, I'm trying to think of like, did you get to the level that would shut no, you up? No, you know, lead in a movie. I always said my goal was like to be three movies deep. That means you're doing a movie and it's a juicy fucking role. Right. You're going right into another movie that's another juicy fucking role. And you're in talks about being cast. Right, in a juicy and, you know, fucking so role. You're, yeah, you, so you like and then And then you think about, let's talk about how many people are living that life. Well, very Your few. very good friend Denzel. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But back then he was probably the only black dude. Then, you know, Wesley Snipes, you know, the guys who came yeah. up. But that's where I was then. Uh, and and I thought by the time I get to my age now, I thought I would be retired. I didn't think that there. We all thought you were. <laughs> but we. I didn't think people would really want me, you know. Well, it's I'm funny to explain to people. I know. It's funny to explain to people how. Like comedians in their fifties, by this point, thirty years ago, were doing Westbury like venues you've never heard of. Like you're like your parents would go to Westbury Music Fair. Yeah, I Westbury there. Music Fair. Like yeah, and and like Cosby and Bob Newhart and all those guys and Don Rickles would be in that realm. That's but so now, scary. like Dave, Chris, Kevin are doing arenas. Even Jim, like when Jim really blew up, I said, Jim, you should do a two-day national tour. You should do one night in Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. Then you fly out and do one night in Dodger, Dodger Stadium. And of course, Jim was at the same, no, he says, no, I want to be Robert De Niro. Man, why would I do that? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh God, I don't understand this dude. Well, again, that's like the disease of more and the disease of. I want to be Hamlet. Everybody. Right. Did you, and did you ever, did you reckon with it? Did you get to a point where you're like, all right, I have to, this is making me miserable. This ambition. It didn't ambition. make me that miserable because like I said, I always worked. I always made money. Now I didn't have a $40 million deal at Netflix, but right. you know, I was flush. I bought a house. Yeah. I had a nice life, you know? Yeah. Um, so also there was no other avenue where I said, you know what, I'm going to bag groceries at Ralph's because it's more spiritual. No. I mean, this is what it was. And I figured I'd be retired. I did not t take into account, you know, at my age, I've done my 10,000 hours. I actually know who the fuck I am. I'm who, what, who? Who are you? I'm an actor, man. I'm really comfortable. I'm a dad. Um, I'm an accomplished performer. And meaning... The insecurities have melted away. Yeah, most of them. I didn't shave, so you're really fine. seeing the real me. If anyone yeah, just man. turns on to this, they're gonna think <laughs> it's uh, yeah, Le but they're gonna think I mean? LeVar Burton is on blocks. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm comfortable with who I am, and I'm getting really good roles and offered things and considered for things that are probably some of the best roles of my life. I mean, to do the patient. That was a limited series. Uh, it was such it was a Carell. Yes, it was such right. a good role. The only fucked up thing is I couldn't tell one joke because it was so serious. Yep. And I would just sit there and just go to my trailer and yell and scream because it was really, okay, guys, when you're ready, you know, take done. your own action. Yeah, right? We would action. meditate and then go into these takes. Yeah. It was beautiful, but part of me was still like, I just want to tell some stupid yeah. joke. We can't. Like, I remember I went in and I was about 10 minutes late because I was trying to find the sound stage. Everyone is there. The patient had already started production. Very quiet, very studious. I come into the uh, sound stage and I said, I was the only black person there. And I just looked around and I said, well... This is clearly racist. Mm. Not a harumph. Oof. Not a smile. HR. The HR not sirens an sirens. eyebrow raised. Yeah. It, and I went, 
Ooh, that was the last joke I told. I was yeah. like, dude, just shut the fuck up. This is a great role. Just act. But no, after that, they didn't even look up. It wasn't even like, I know what you're doing. It's not the place. <laughs> it was just, did you hear something? Yeah. Do you read into that at all? Do you read into the idea that- I read that, the room. But I mean, saying, the no, other no, way to go would have been like, I know I'm fucking somebody <laughs> up in this bitch. Oh, y'all ain't gonna laugh no, at I'm my saying, shit. <laughs> the fact that you now have like persevered what do you mm -hmm. think was going to happen in your life and what happened? I, I would probably, you know, be retired. I'd be yeah. moved out of L.A., take my little savings, get a nice, I don't know, two-bedroom in Arizona. Robert Guillaume. You'd <laughs> yeah, be <but> Robert <laughs> Guillaume? Yes. Although he worked late. He really did. He really did. But He's now, a bad example. But I'm at a different place, man. Now because now I'm at a place that I strive so hard to get. I feel like I'm more well-known right now than I've ever been. I forget, you know, as a young performer, I forgot that your audience grows old with you. Yeah. I remember I performed, I forget what city it was in, and we drive out to the club. You know, I checked in the hotel and everything. We drive out to the club, no cars. I get to the basement club, and the club's not full. And uh, I'm like, damn, what the fuck? Should I sell my merchandise? And uh, one of the security guards, he said, oh, yeah. He said, don't worry about it, man little brother these are true fans and i was like what are you talking about just sell your shit so the club was maybe two-thirds full every person in that audience lined up and waited to meet me first of all i never did meet and greets the first 10 12 years i didn't want to i just no i'm not doing that and it felt low rent yeah man yeah i, I, I was bringing my actor shit in when i leave the stage i get into my car my driver takes me home where I drink four bourbons mm -hmm. and take three sleeping pills. Why are you going after Denzel like that? <laughs> no, but, but what happened is I, I made these t-shirts and yep. started selling shit. I had DAG merch, the one where it was like the third, it, you look like a dictator. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I yeah, had yeah, one yeah. of those shirts. But I mean, in, in the process of that, I started meeting my audience because to sell merchandise, it's pretty much a meet and greet. Right. You know, yeah. and I enjoyed it because I was getting older. So by this point, I'm like maybe 40 or something. And I just had a different point of view. I started to view my audience differently. And um, these were people, your ride or dies, man. Yeah. And uh, they're still here. They grow. They're growing old with me. Um, and I've, I have the sense that... You get new fans and you keep the old ones. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, but people go... They're just giving me... They, meaning the public and the industry, seems to give me respect. And do you... Have you accepted... It's humbling is what I wanted to say. It was not like, as they should. Yeah. But um, it, it is very humbling and, and, and I... Humbling in the truest sense, not in the, I won a Tony Award and I'm so humbled. No, no. I'm going to tell you something. And this, this happened over and over. Uh, one day, it was really hot blistering hot day in LA and I was just pissed off I went to the pet store and this doesn't guy doesn't have a pet just goes there to talk <laughs> but wait the dog the dog dude he was delivering dog food and this is a black guy middle aged drenched in sweat he's picking up 50 pound bags slinging him and he stops and looks at me and he said man I just want to tell you you make my life better it, what is what is better than that this yeah. is a fucking Laborer. Yeah. Every day. A low laborer. A <laughs> well, low no, but I'm down. saying, yeah. no, I'll yes. guarantee you, nobody in that fucking store said, hey, man, I just want to thank you for bringing that kibble, man. Yeah. No. Yes. Every day, strangers, at least once a day, stop me and say, I, thank you. Um, I love you. Uh, I've been a fan for many years. And no, that is. Can you make sense of it? Like, do you ever think, why yeah. me? Well, yeah, because we're still, I am i don't know about you, but I'm still a fan. Like, the first time when I was a little kid, well, let's roll it back. When I came out to L.A. the first time, this is when they had, I think it was a $5 Monday at the comedy store. And I went, because it was broke. And, you know, I had $5. I saw Jimmy J.J. Walker. I was like, oh, my God, that's a TV star. Mm -hmm. Like, for real. Like, I was seeing these dudes yeah. that I grew up watching. And um, so I still have that part in me. And I think that when people, especially television, they take you in. Well, like, what do you think that means? Okay, explain your life to me. Meaning, like, 
what do you make of it? Do you just go like, wow, this is amazing that I got to be Jimmy J.J. Walker or one of the, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, like a, my version of that <laughs> thing, yeah. I got to be Robert Guillaume. I got to be uh, Sidney Portier sometimes. Like, what do you make of it? I just feel blessed. I hold it to heart. And it was a natural progression because again, when I was younger, I was trying to get what I got. I'm not there yet. I don't have time to yeah. talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You like what I did on living yeah. color. I have a lot more in me, you know, but you only watched 40 sketches of mine, sir. <laughs> There's so much more to me than yes. the hours of me well, you no, watched. They didn't. I remember when I did Shakespeare in the Park. It was Richard III in like 94 or something. Living Color was still on. My goal was to get through a performance and not have someone say, Homie, don't play that. <laughs> Three snaps. You know, tell, tell some dick and pussy jokes, which is... Bronx editing for if you've ever performed there, but that was my goal. I hope the audience goes with me and allows me. Yeah, man, they went with me. They went with me and it was gangbusters. Um, I didn't perceive all of that. All of us, my crowd, all rolling with me until we all grow old. I yeah. just didn't Well, see you don't that think far. about it. No, I thought in living color, um, I thought when we went off the air, I was ready. I wanted my own TV show. Uh -huh. That became my goal. You know, the David Allen Greer show or whatever. Then I'll be Without Richard all this famous. dead weight of Jim Carrey, <laughs> Damon well, no. Wayans, and stupid Keenan. So Get away from me, Jamie Foxx. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Uh, sold into syndication. Uh -huh. Rich for days. I don't never have to work again. I just couldn't pull it off. I, it never happened. Um, a bunch of times right, where that wasn't meant to be. No, this was, what do you make of that fatalism? What do you make of that? I don't know, man. I know that I feel probably the most secure yeah. I have ever felt in my life, just in terms of the mechanics of my career, because after 40 years in the business, you know who the fuck I am. If you don't just watch some footage yeah. and, I, uh, you know, I can handle this. I can do the job. It's a no-brainer now. And that's what I think has fed into my expanding career. I didn't think it was going to be expanding. I thought it would just be, you know, or, hey, man, what happened? There? Is that Neil? Yep. Man. Now, wait a minute. We met when, you, this is when I remember, when Dave Chappelle opened for me. He middled yes. at the uh, Carolines. Correct. He was 18 years old. Correct. And you, as I recall, were there every night. You guys were in there. Yes, you I was buddy. also 18. I didn't know who the fuck you I were. Was I was like, rat. I guess, yeah, I guess that's Dave's I was friend. grimy. I yeah, was very remember. grimy, stringy. And my friends would come. Like, like Joel Siegel came. He's like, hey, man, great. And I said, hey, I wrote two new jokes. Did you see him? He's like, yeah, that's really cool. Who was that guy that met him? <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Man, he was really great. Great seeing you, Dave. Oh. There was so many told me a story about Dave. <laughs> That Dave's in high school, Ugh. and I have two high school Dave stories. Dave's in high school. He's on stage. Martin is in D.C. Mm -hmm. for the weekend. Martin's blowing he's up. He's from, from D.C. Yeah, he's Ooh, from D.C. He was there. He uh, in uh, uh, Do the Right Thing had just come out. Dave's on stage, and someone says to Martin, what do you think of this kid? Martin goes, I don't know, but I can't stop fucking looking at him. Well, he was, he was great. Yeah. He was professional, and I really liked him. Yeah. You know, he was like a, my, my so main sweet. thing, honestly, yeah. was I'm headlining, stay out of my way, and don't fuck up the dressing room. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know who you were. I don't even think he went in the dressing room. He was there. I remember. Was he? He had a different girl, probably brought about almost every night. Not you know, throw an opportunity like that away to show off. He was 18. Come yeah. on, man. And um, so I remember him. And I. Yeah, he was great. He was really good. Yeah, he, he was, was a very fucking great comedian. And, uh, like a professional comic, because yeah. he was. He wasn't yeah, he was. like, you know what's crazy in high school? No, no, he wasn't doing that shit. He had a joke in high school <laughs> that, about Alf to, br yes. to bring Alf back around. Uh, it's a good thing Alf landed in a white neighborhood and not a black neighborhood, because if he landed in a black neighborhood, three weeks later, you would have seen brothers wearing Alf skin coats. Yes, yes. This is yes. a high school kid. <laughs> Ah. wrote that joke. Yeah, but I felt that way about him. I felt that way about Chris Rock. The the joke that really sent me James Earl Ray. No, That's the, that was, was the my one Chris Rock joke. Where he's when I first saw Chris, 
He said, at Catch Rising, sorry, he said, well, you know, uh, we had a science fair at my school and all the kids brought their science projects. I brought my dad under glass because I had one. I had a father. <laughs> so really smart, really yeah. funny, you know. Yes. So I was like, oh, I can roll with this Okay, dude. I yeah, 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 I can roll with this um, And uh, you seem like a sunny guy. Yeah, but I mean. I feel like if someone, if a loved one, a daughter, a, a wife, a girlfriend wants to talk to you about something, is your attitude like, okay? Or is it like, okay, I'm a human being, man. I'm a human being. I, I have not gone through, no, I'm not, you know, if you're saying like, just get out of the dressing room because David's known to punch my <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm just <laughs> no. wondering, you don't, you you seem not that interested in your, uh, you don't feel especially sorry for yourself. You don't, don't get, think you I, don't get, you don't get in your feelings, so to speak. I do, but I just don't feel like I have, a lot to get in them about. Like uh, when I was growing up, I never heard my parents argue. I actually, when my dad left, he came back for that first Christmas and they were fighting. We were all like on the stairs, but the fight was like, that is a falsehood. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, Bill, you're avoiding what I am trying to lay out. That is absolutely false. And I would like to find my flute. So this was a level. And then he played the flute. <laughs> right. This was a level of arguing, man. I mean, yeah. I grew up with upstanding Negroes. I didn't grow up with no crazy shit, even yeah. though my friends. Where did you grow up in? Was middle class? Upper middle class? Yeah, man. I, my neighborhood looked like uh, Griffith Park around their old house, like old Tudor house built yeah. in the 20s, about 4,000 square feet. No, it was nice. I mean, but I've never... That's who I am. That's who I grew well, up. Well, that's what I mean. You're like not a dark guy, but you can play. You can play whatever. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's funny. I remember there was a show. It was a musical called Big River, and it was about Huck Finn. You know, I. It's impossible to imagine it. <laughs> looking at you, David. Go ahead. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Jim the Slave. The yes. Slave. Well, you know, there's a book now called James. Yes. Do you know about the his I, real I have, story. Yes. It's like when a rapper names the album after their real name. Yeah. Right. And you're like, you know. okay. These nuts. No, this is Damien Lucretius Smith. Uh huh. <laughs> and there's like usually a Sunday school picture. Yeah, that's correct. That's he correct. He looks like a human being. Yeah. yeah. So I auditioned for this over and over for Jim the Slave, and I didn't get it. And this is after I'd been on, in, on Broadway already and I'd been nominated for a Tony. I was just crestfallen. I was really, really Like devastated. if you didn't give it to me, who'd you give it to? Right. Well, they hired a guy who looked like he was a runaway slave. You know, me, I, and this is a folly of youth. I was like, why didn't I get this role as a slave? You know, <laughs> Hawk. Yeah, hello, Yale. <laughs> exactly, Hawk. I think I can petition someone for my freedom. You know, it was like, nah, bro, no, bro, no, bro. You know, and I look back on that shit and I laugh because in the moment I really thought uh, I can get this, I can pull it, not knowing where my parameters were and not, you know what I mean, where my strength was. You know, it's funny because we, now we are, we're aged men and uh, we've got perspective and but you can't get perspective without perspective. Yeah, it takes time. That you can't. You literally can't. You don't have the ingredients mm -hmm. to see a longitudinal thing where you're like considered one thing. And the ups and downs of like so and so's hot. Yeah, man. Now they're not. Now they died of a drug overdose. Mm -hmm. Now that and you just have to. The older you get, the more you can sort of like be cool. But you don't want to hear that. You know, in 1920, no. I actually went to a uh, fortune teller, a medium or whatever. And you heard the Mooney, or not, uh, George Wallace and Jerry Seinfeld fortune teller story? Mm -mm. Been confirmed by both of them. They drive out here from New York, literally in like a Ford LTD. They're here. They're on Melrose. It's 1977. Neither of them are, they've both been doing stand-up two, three years. Go to a fortune teller. And uh, Fortune Teller looks at George Wallace's hand and is like, or Palm Reader, and says, uh, "Why wow, you're going to be very, very rich, right? George is uh, like, fucking great. Next one up, Jerry Seinfeld looks at Jerry's hand and goes, I thought you were going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, my life is more like this. As wrong as I was about Jim Carrey's movie, oh, I auditioned for Seinfeld. And I came away... Like, well, this sucks, number one. 
Jerry can't fuck act the judges his way. Eddie, exactly. Eddie's joke. Yeah. Jerry can't act his way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And we saw again. him on Benson. <laughs> right, right. But the historical society's coming to dinner. Got some great jokes the governor can use. <laughs> you want to hear them? You're not a joke writer, Frankie. You're a messenger. Please, I'm a curry. Then go curry. <laughs> Wrong again. So whatever I say, go the other fucking way. Yeah. Similar to that story. Uh, it was numerology. So he, he does my wife's numbers. I'm like, oh, wow. Well, you know what? There's a lot of struggle. A lot of issues. Uh, it looks very dark for you now. But you're going to make it out. And there will be some daylight in a few years. Something like that. Tied right into her story. Chick gets to me and she goes, <laughs> same thing. Wow. <laughs> you are, I've never seen numbers like this. You haven't even come into your own. Uh, she said, you're probably going to start really coming into your career and your fame and your fortune when you're 33. Uh, I was like, really? And we get How old car, are you at this point? 30. Oh, okay. Something like that. Just wait it out. We get in the we get on the we get in the uh gypsy cab to go home and she was crying. We just fought for two days. Yeah, because I got a better reading. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, we divorced. I know you we got divorced, it. Certainly after sure. That. Uh did she get half of the thirty three year old money? Uh she got half of whatever that money I got. Okay. You know? And uh we've built back since then. That's fantastic. Fine. Yeah. And I hope she's happy. That's but wait, all we what did George Wallace do? Was he an insurance salesman? He had some straight job. I can't job, remember. Like an accountant? Yeah, for a while. Dude, when I started going on the road, I think it was Indianapolis, something like that. I come into this club. My shit was, I'm doing two shows. I don't give a fuck how many tickets I sell. I'm not doing three shows because I went through that and I get burned out. And three shows a night for me, one of those shows is going to suck so mm -hmm. fucking bad. The last one. Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever been on, this happened to me, where you tell a joke and it's like, did I already tell did that I, joke? Yeah, all the time. Oh, my God. Anyway, yeah. they said George Wallace. As bad as my concussion is? <laughs> I can't remember. George, God this, this, is what the, this is what the chick said. George Wallace was doing six shows a day. They started at two in the afternoon. And between shows, he would have dinner at the bar. And talk to people the whole time. As they were coming in. The most affable guy. Oh, yeah. Literally energized by the presence of people. Loves comedy. Came to see me in Atlanta last time I was there. A I love fantastic George. guy. I love George, but I could never, ever do that. Of course not, but that's just, that's personality-wise. Yes, and and I, so I would perform. I didn't party. I would go back to my hotel Watch TV and get up again. You know the what road? is your what uh, what's your acting process? I'm I'm in that I don't know anyone that's as, probably as trained as you. What is your like? It's real basic. I'll tell you this. You know, like when we did the Wiz, the um, which one? The Wiz Live on TV. That was a couple years ago. Like five six okay. years ago. Now I did the Cowardly Lion and. M Artistically and creatively, my goal was with every role, I want to make this a three-dimensional person, a complete human being. We're talking about the whiz. Do you think about results? Meaning, like, do you think about, I can get a laugh with this? No. I try to start from a neutral place. I try to peel away all the tricks that we know we all have, you know, or whatever, uh -huh. really boost the joke. And I try to find whatever humor is there organically from the material. Um, but like any other desperado follows fails, you know, I'm grabbing the nuts and cluck a little bit. Say what? <laughs> Hell no. no. You know, uh -huh. but uh, that's what I try to do. I mean, so you like, are you a good memorizer? Yeah. Yeah, I can. That's just a muscle that you've developed or now like, is I that can. Yes, yes, yes. It was hard, but um, now, I mean, I didn't really have a lot of lines before. Oh, that's funny. It was not like I'm doing two page. Monologue. But you're doing plays. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But oh, you're yeah. doing Shakespeare. I mean, like yeah. That. No, I yeah. I mean, come on. That's what we do. I I can do that. Anyway, that's my that's my 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 basic philosophy is to humanize, find everything. I also don't feel like you know these actors who go, oh, you have to be in love with your you know fucking uh, pedophile um, right fucking uh, vampire role. No. You don't. Because most people I know 
hate themselves. So I don't, I don't, I never got in this trap like I have to love my character. No, I just have to understand why this person is doing what they're doing. A lot of times, I know you've had this kind of encounter. Someone who is emotionally stunted. So in, in any kind of environment in which they are tested or pressured or, or needled and emotional, they will revert back to a meltdown, physical violence, acting horribly. So understanding that is that inside, they're triggered, man. Yeah. They're triggered. They go right back to where they were. Right. I don't, and they don't think they're wrong, or they no. may think they're wrong in uh, in ten minutes, but they're not well, 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 like a, like a person. Okay, the real thing is, I'm gonna punch Neil because uh, fuck him. I'm gonna punch yeah, him when enough. I see him today. So it's gonna be months and months. No, when I see Neil, I'm gonna punch him. Um, we're somewhere. I fucking punch you, and I feel just like when I was a kid. Oh, I fucked up. I'm an asshole. Yeah. I just made a fool of myself. I just why did I do this? You know, you feel terrible, horrible. Uh, that's a human uh, reaction. So those are the that's the backstory of a character. If I were playing them, that is how I uh, approach it. Not I love her. Yeah. I love him. No, that doesn't work for me. And you also don't get too hung up on me whatever a method. There's no yeah. right or wrong method. It's just like, I don't know, it's how do you get there? No. I, on, on, do you are you you ever do scenes with people and be like, this shallow motherfucker is, yes. is going to make me worse? Yes, and immediately I start devising how I'm going to act around them. How am I going to preserve my performance? You know, because yeah, they can drag not, you into I'm their, not in yeah. a, no, Also, I'm trying to be good. You yeah. got to stay ab above the fray. So how can I repair this? How can I survive this ordeal? I've worked on movies in which, you know what, Neil, you can go home. I don't really need you off camera. For people who don't know, you know, usually in a traditional movie, I do my close-up, you do your close-up. When you do your close-up, you need me. But to Neil, stand there and to why do did it, you yes, step so you on like, my bunion? What? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I've had that. And because if I feel like the actor I'm working with, which has happened, is trying to undermine my performance. Laughing. So you've had oh, I people have. try to undermine you. Laughing, I'm not even talking. Yeah. Laughing, giggling. Do you think they really. know they're doing it? Yeah, or that, yes, yeah. we're adults. Uh -huh. And it doesn't have to be subversive, like I'm going to kill you and bring you down. It's just... Uh, Energetic. I already did my shit, so I'm gonna take a call or look at. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, Neil, why'd you kill the guy? Like, you're not giving me anything. It's cool. I got it. I'd rather read with the AD and be by myself. And Are there performances coverage. where you're judging other people's performance in the movie or show, and you can tell? What do you mean? <laughs> While <laughs> I'm acting? Yeah. I hope not. No, I hope not. I mean, half the time is I'm just trying to make it work. I'm trying right. to make it good. You know what the greatest joy is for an actor? Getting pussy? Good, oh, well, that's what Jonathan Winters said when I finally met him. He came and said, I bet you get a lot of pussy. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my heroes. Yeah. Will you hear what Keenan, what Cosby said to Keenan? What? When, he, when they were doing uh, Fat Albert, he goes, you're going to be getting so much buzz you're going to need three dicks yeah that, that hits a little different now <laughs> you know in the present cosby mm -hmm. i worked with cosby he mentored when when we did damon uh i think our director white soul john uh -huh. Whitesell, maybe yeah he took us to lunch at bill cosby's townhouse and it, this is one of the most incredible afternoons of my life it was after ennis i think his son died mm -hmm. He was open with all that. He talked uh, about that. He served us lunch. Now, what I was waiting for was for the hammer to drop because he was so nice, so gracious, um, so loving and mentoring. Please don't curse. Why do you have to do mm -hmm. crackheads? That never came. Never came. Um, it was It was crazy. At one point, he took us downstairs, and there was a little watercolor, and it looked like a child's watercolor. And he said, um, 
I think maybe his son had painted it when he was a little kid. And he said, well, look at it again. I'm looking at it. And he said, that's the site of my son's murder, Ennis. And I just, my heart stopped. And he said, but look again. You see that in the corner? I'm like, he said, that's the sun. That is positive. That means we're going to get through this. I mean, just, I didn't know this motherfucker. He yeah. was like, when, when people open like that, I'm like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. You know, I, I came out of there like, I wish, I wish people could see this, I know. man. And, um, yeah. I know. And, but people are uh, what they call complex. They really are. And they, he can mean that and mean the other stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. the, that's the rub. Yes, yes, yes. But, um. It was really... Have you had the Farrakhan <laughs> interaction? Well, when we were on Living Color, we all These went are the out. classic but famous black interactions. There's the, Everybody's got a Cosby store and a Farrakhan story. <laughs> well, well, we were all eating out. So it was like me, Damon, Kim, like half of Living mm-hmm. Color. And some fish place. And uh, one of the nation came over and he said, look, we have tickets for you. Uh, all you young uh, kings, you know, to come see the minister. It's like, oh, where's he playing? You know, Dodger Stadium, some shit. It looked mm-hmm. huge thing yeah. in the 90s. And it's like, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just give you these. You ask for brother so-and-so. We're going to put you on the dais right behind the minister, which is a place of honor. And I was like, oh, my God. That's incredible. So the dude leaves. And I'm like, I'm like so should we so carpool? Damn, like, man, ain't going to that motherfucker. Are you out your mind? You never work again. That's the best. You're like, we're doing it. They're just ripping the tickets up. And you're like, hey, I was I like, thought- my shit, my whole, my fucking dome is about to get blown off with yeah. all this real knowledge. I fucking died laughing. He was like, hell no. This what the fuck is, is wrong with you? Uh, we got to wrap it up. Wait, um, what do you, you no, that's, we got to wrap it up. I that's enough. About- that's enough of. That's enough of your experience Ooh. and life. Wow. David Elgar, one of the greats, uh, a great guy as a ray of sunshine. <laughs> g- genuinely, uh, a, he's he's helped us all along the way. Yeah, um, it's like the dog guy. Yeah, yep. Guy. And uh, he's a great, he's one of the greats. Yeah.